Okay, so um, just got the signal to get started. So our next session is called Perspectives on US Monetary Policy Tools and Instruments. Um, so I'm Adrian Oclair, I'm an assistant professor here in the Department of Economics, and I teach monetary economics to our first and second year PhD students. And in, in my classes, uh, when monetary policy changes, it's a change in the short-term uh, short uh, nominal rate of interest uh, that's assumed to be fully passed through to households and uh, firms. Um, and so we worry in my classes very little about the plumbing. Um, and uh, we also have uh, we a little to say about uh, other kinds of tools that have been put in place uh, since 2008, like uh, quantitative easing. Uh, but however, there's been a lot of interesting uh, recent research and policy discussions on these topics. Uh, and so it's my pleasure to introduce uh, our speaker today, Jim Hamilton from UCSD. Uh, and then the discussant will be Peter Ireland. I want to talk about the nuts and bolts of the tools and instruments by which monetary policy is implemented. The traditional tool for the U.S. was the Fed funds rate, an interest rate on overnight loans between banks. When that got down essentially to zero in 2008, the Fed tried to further stimulate the economy with another possible tool, the size of its balance sheet, hoping that with large purchases of uh, securities, we could bring long-term interest rates down. And those Two tools are still being used, uh, decisions essentially at each FOMC meeting. And the main points I want to make is that the balance sheet, I think, matters today not from the asset side, but from the liabilities side. And if those liabilities continue to shrink, it raises some significant complications for how uh, the Fed can control uh, the short-term interest rate, the Fed funds rate. And, and I'll suggest some uh, other directions we might want to consider going. Uh, so first, a few comments on the, uh, the balance sheet uh, expansion. Uh, we got started on that, as I said, when the Fed funds rate was essentially at zero, and there was an idea that by purchasing large quantities of treasury securities and mortgage-backed securities, we might be able to bring the long-term interest rate down. And that was implemented in a series of three phases, sometimes called QE1, which added a uh, trillion and a half or so to the securities the Fed was holding. Uh, they took a little pause, and then QE2 added close to another trillion. QE3, by the end of which they brought it up to four and a half trillion, and then uh, we're currently in a phase of very slowly uh, unwinding that. Uh, and here's a graph that uh, Mike Woodford pointed out some time ago, and I've kind of updated it. Uh, this is the, a summary of the long-term interest rate, which uh, that expansion of the Fed's balance sheet was supposed to affect. And I think it's interesting to notice that in uh, QE1, uh, sorry about that, that's right. QE1, the, the first uh, green area there, the Fed was buying and buying, trying to bring the long-term interest rate down. It went up and up. The Fed said, okay, we've done enough to stimulate the economy, let's take a pause. Interest rates come down. Fed said, we better stimulate some more, bring those long-term rates down. Up they go. Fed said, that's enough of that. Down they come. Uh, QE3, same story. And maybe you see some move up in this latest red phase, but if you do, you're a little creative at interpreting graphs like this. Now, obviously, we can get into a lot of details. There were some more details and discussion from Ken and Andy this morning, and I'm, I'm not saying it was, was ineffective, but I think the conclusion you have to draw from this is that whatever effect LSAP was having on long-term interest rates, other factors were more important. And you say, well, maybe it would have gone up even more if we hadn't had QE1. Uh, okay, but uh, th there, were, there were other factors uh, that were key. And, and certainly I think the, uh, the response of long-term interest rates, if we were to uh, further reduce the, the Fed's holdings of securities, uh, should not be one of our major concerns in, in deciding what to do with the balance sheet now. And as I said, I think the concerns are with the liability side, and I'm going to come back to that at the end. But before I get into any of that, I thought it'd be helpful to have some, uh, go back to basics here, a uh, very fundamental question everybody's pretty familiar with. How exactly does a central bank control the short-term interest rate? And one answer to that question, used a lot of places around the world, is a corridor system. 
I'll use the ECB as an example of that. The way it works is the central bank uh, offers to lend banks as much as they want at some interest rate, call it I sub L, and the policy decision is what that interest rate's going to be. And that interest rate at which the central bank offers to lend to private banks basically puts a ceiling on the interest rates on loans between banks. Why should I pay more than I sub L to borrow from some other bank when the central bank will lend me all I want at, at I sub L? It puts a ceiling. And the other part of the corridor system is that the central bank offers to pay interest, uh, call it ID, on deposits that are left with the central bank at the end of the day. You can think of those as essentially loans from the private bank overnight to the central bank. And it's another thing I can do with my funds if I'm at a bank. And that puts a floor under the interest rate. Why should I lend to another bank at some interest rate lower than that when I can earn I sub D just by parking my money with the central bank? So it's a corridor system. There's a ceiling, there's a floor, and the interest rate trades between those. Here, for example, is how that worked in the case of the ECB. The orange line is this lending rate, uh, the ceiling set by policy. The blue is the uh, deposit rate, uh, the floor. And the gray is one measure of the interest rate on interbank loans. The gray trades in between the ceiling and the floor. And in recent years, they actually moved that floor, the blue line, into negative territory, uh, not paying interest, but assessing a fee on banks when they leave the deposits with the ECB. And that's the way uh, the ECB has moved into the negative interest rate uh, that we were talking about uh, a little bit earlier. So, so that's the traditional corridor system. The U.S. has never operated that way. Uh, we did have something that you would think maybe could be like the uh, ceiling, the discount rate. We've always had an opportunity for banks in the U.S. to borrow from the Federal Reserve at an interest rate, the discount rate. But for most of the last half century, that discount rate served as a floor, not a ceiling, on the Fed funds rate. And let me just show you that data. Here's a graph. The blue line is the discount rate the rate at which banks can borrow from the Fed. The red line is the Fed funds rate, the rate at which banks can borrow from each other. And you can see that for much of this period, the red line was above the blue line. This thing wasn't a uh, ceiling at all. It was functioning more like a, a floor on interest rates. So uh, what's going on? Why did banks say, well, I'd rather pay more to borrow from this other bank than I'd have to pay to borrow from the Fed? And the answer was there were non-pecuniary costs. Banks perceived a cost from borrowing from the Federal Reserve. Uh, namely, other banks would think I'm weak if I have to borrow from the Fed instead of borrowing from another private bank. And banks were willing to pay for the privilege of borrowing from another private bank rather than having to go to the discount window. So what happened in that system? If the supply of reserves uh, from the Fed were reduced, well, banks still have to maintain reserves somehow. They'd be forced to borrow them even though they didn't want to. And being forced to borrow them would basically bid up the spread between the Fed funds rate and the discount rate. The Fed funds rate was basically determined by the non-pecuniary costs associated with discount window borrowing. Uh, here's a way we sometimes used to think about that system, that uh, graph I took from Marvin Goodfriend here. Uh, it's a graph of the, the historical Fed funds market, like in the 1970s. Uh, horizontal axis, we have the, the total quantity of deposits that private banks have with the Fed. Vertical axis, we have an interest rate. And there'd be non-borrowed reserves, reserves that the Fed put out there through open market operations that banks wouldn't have to, uh, to, to borrow. They're just out there. And there's some discount rate that the Fed separately uh, fixes. Uh, and uh, the only way we'd get an additional supply of reserves into the system beyond what was from non-borrowed reserves would be if banks go to the discount window and borrow some more. They're only willing to do that uh, insofar as uh, they have to. Uh, they're going to borrow up to the point where the, the difference between the Fed funds rate and the discount rate is equal to the marginal non-pecuniary cost of, of borrowing. 
and you get an equilibrium in the uh, in the Fed funds market. It, that's it. Sounds like kind of a crazy system, but it it pretty much worked. Here's a graph. Uh, the top panel shows this gap between the Fed funds rate and the discount rate. So when that's positive, banks are paying for the privilege of being able to borrow from another bank rather than having to borrow from the Fed. And the bottom line uh, graph shows the total quantity of discount window borrowing. And it was a pretty clear relation in the old days. Uh, when there's more discount window borrowing, there's a bigger gap between the Fed funds rate and the discount rate. In fact, sometimes uh, in those days we thought of it as really a borrowed reserves targeting procedure uh, rather than a, a Fed funds uh, targeting procedure. So uh, what would be a ceiling in the European system functioned uh, kind of like a floor in the historical U.S. system. Now, that's changed in recent years, and the reason is we've now added the other element that's present in the typical corridor system. The Fed now pays interest on reserves. Uh, now, in the traditional corridor system, that is supposed to be a floor under something like the Fed funds rate. It's actually functioned up until recently as a ceiling. Uh, so the ceiling is a floor, the floor is a ceiling. So let me show you a graph of this. So this is a graph. The green line here is the uh, interest rate on excess reserves. That's what a bank can earn just by leaving the money overnight with the Fed. And the, uh, the red line is the effective Fed funds rate. Effective fund funds rate was always trading below the uh, uh, interest on excess reserves. And not only was it a ceiling, for a while it was a deterministic ceiling. Deterministic meaning if you knew the interest on excess reserves, you'd know most days exactly what the Fed funds rate was going to be. It was going to be the interest on reserves minus nine basis points, day after day, nine basis points, bing, bing, bing. And then the last day of the month, suddenly it would, it would uh, fall way down. And when the Fed would raise interest on excess reserves, okay, uh, this goes up. So what's going on with that? Well, again, there's some non-pecuniary uh, items going on there. Well, so the first question is why in the world was, was anybody uh, uh, lending Fed funds when they could just park the funds at the Fed and earn the higher rate? Well, certain institutions which had Fed deposits weren't allowed to earn that interest. Uh, and the key player in recent years has been the federal home loan banks. Uh, so they were willing to lend to private banks at an interest rate below the interest on excess reserves. That's not the whole answer to the question, though, because you'd, you'd wonder why didn't uh, the, the banks that could earn the interest arbitrage away? This looks like free money to be made. I borrow Fed funds at a low rate. I park it with the Fed. It's free arbitrage. Why don't we do an infinite amount of that in order to force the Fed funds rate to equal the uh, interest on excess reserves? Well, again, there are these non-pecuniary uh, institutional factors. When a, if a bank tried to play this arbitrage game, borrow Fed funds, park them with the Fed, they would expand their balance sheet. Assets of the bank would be bigger. And we had a regulatory system in which banks were actually penalized for that. One example would be the FDIC fees, which are based on your total assets. If you borrow Fed funds, park them with the Fed, you have a higher FDIC fee. Okay, that puts a limit on how much you're willing to do this. The European banks weren't so subject to that, and so they, had, they were bigger players in this game of borrowing uh, Fed funds from the federal home loan banks and parking them with the Fed. Other uh, costs were capital costs, capital requirements. If you expanded your balance sheet, uh, you were subject to additional requirements. In the case of the European banks, curiously, those requirements were based on the last day of the month. And so they happily played this game every other day. They pulled out of the market on the last day of the month, and that's what was accounting for these, these sudden spikes. Well, you could think about that system the same kind of way we thought about the historical system. Okay, there's some non-pecuniary cost here, and you're going to play this arbitrage up to the point where the marginal uh, non-pecuniary cost equals the difference between the rates. And so uh, here's a little schematic of that. Uh, the horizontal axis, we've got the total volume of Fed funds that are borrowed or lent. Uh, the vertical axis is an interest rate. Uh, interest on excess reserves here is setting a ceiling in this system on the, uh, the interest rate in the, uh, the Fed funds market. And it's setting a ceiling in that banks are, if you take separately the, uh, the demand for reserves uh, function, uh, the gap between the interest rate in equilibrium and 
uh, in Fed funds transactions and the interest on excess reserves is going to be this non-pecuniary cost of borrowing. And we were at such an expanded level of uh, overall deposits with the Fed, that was basically a constant, nine basis points on a typical day and then dropping down elsewhere. So uh, it's kind of a fu uh, uh, an odd system and it made that, that interest rate um, uh, not really meaningful. Uh, now, uh, so what was the, the, the key tool of monetary policy? Well, there's a separate interest rate uh, that the Fed created by which uh, institutions like the federal home loan banks could effectively lend to the Fed, and that was the reverse repo rate. And that was also a facility uh, available for money market funds. And that is the true floor on interest rates in the current operating system. And here I'm illustrating that not with the Fed funds rate, which has become kind of irrelevant. It's just this institutional thing I, I just described. Here I'm using the, uh, the interest rate on uh, 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 general collateralized finance, uh, which, uh, which is obviously a market rate. That's this black thing. And you can see that the uh, uh, reverse repo rate in blue has effectively been a floor under the GCF rate. So we have a floor that's kind of like a ceiling on the Fed funds, the interest on excess reserves, and we have a real floor in interest rates. That's the reverse, uh, the reverse repo. But there's no reason interest on excess reserves is a ceiling for this market. Uh, and here I've plotted uh, in blue the uh, reverse repo rate, in green the interest on excess reserves, in black is this market interest rate short-term uh, repos uh, on, on treasury securities. And you'll see that the green is, is not a ceiling at all on this market. It is on the Fed funds market, or at least it used to be on the Fed funds market for reasons I said. It's, it's not on, on GCF. For a while, GCF would typically be below uh, interest on excess reserves. But in recent months, it's moved significantly above. And, and there's no reason why it shouldn't. There's no, uh, nothing in the system, no incentive that says an interest rate on something like GCF couldn't go above uh, interest on excess reserves. There is something saying it can't go below the reverse repo rate. Now, it's interesting to notice that this increasing gap of GCF rate above interest on excess reserves coincide with the vanishing of the gap between interest on excess reserves and Fed funds. So. Fed funds rate is in the graph on the right. GCF is in the graph on the left. In both graphs in green, I've got interest on excess reserves. And I was commenting uh, in the right graph that a year ago, there was sort of this deterministic relation between interest on excess reserves and the Fed funds rate, bing, 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 day after day, nine basis points different. You'll see that in recent months that disappeared. In recent months, it's no longer the case that the Fed funds rate is below the interest on excess reserves. In fact, it started occasionally to trade above the interest on excess reserves. And of course, this was a floor after all, the way we were, I originally said we might think about it. There's, there's no reason, nothing keeping really that interest rate from going, going above. It's coincided at the same time that the, uh, the GCF has moved consistently above uh, interest on excess reserves. So what's going on? Well, here's a graph. This, I took this straight off the New York Fed's page that, that I think uh, tells us where to look. Uh, this is a graph showing uh, in the blue, it's the effective Fed funds rate, that function I was talking about that uh, historically had been right below the interest on excess reserves, and then in recent months has moved up to be equal or above the interest on excess reserves. The black line is the total volume of trading in Fed funds. And what you see in this graph is that that elimination of that step function, the elimination, for example, of the end of year, end of month spike down in Fed funds, and for that matter, the elimination of the gap between Fed funds and interest on excess reserves coincided with a decrease in the volume of Fed funds traded. 
And why is that significant? Well, we have a couple of places we could, we could look for you know, what happened to that old non-pecuniary cost. One thing you might say is, well, maybe there's been some kind of change in the uh, penalty bank C for expanding their balance sheet. That could explain why that gap between interest on excess reserves and Fed funds disappeared. Or maybe there's something on the supply side. Maybe the federal home loan banks were less willing to lend Fed funds because now they've got something better. And the fact that you see this decline in volume coincide with the elimination of the gap suggests that it's the supply side that changed, not the demand side. Here's a crude summary of that. Uh, I, I just took the end of quarter statements of the federal home loan banks and, and just looked at what uh, assets they were, were holding. Uh, the blue here is Fed funds lent. And as you go through the end of last year, beginning of this year, there's been a significant decline in the end of quarter holdings of Fed funds lent uh, from the federal home loan banks. And instead, they're moving to other assets, other accounts in which they can earn interest. And uh, uh, now this is the end of quarter number. There, it's various reasons you, you wouldn't maybe like that as the ideal number. But I, I think it's, it's painting an interesting picture. What's the picture it's painting? It's saying the federal home loan banks are finding a better game. So while lending Fed funds was the best they could do, but as, for example, that GCF moved up, well, that's another arbitrage opportunity. Now, there are costs from GCF. You'd rather do something safer. But if the gap gets big enough between those, potential lender of Fed funds, like the federal home loan banks, is going to say, OK, I'm not lending Fed funds. I'm doing something, something else with my money. And that is my interpretation of, uh, of what's gone, gone on here. So. Um, we never, uh, we never, it was never operating like a traditional corridor system. Uh, there was a real floor. That's the reverse repo. There is no ceiling uh, in the current system. And so you may say, well, what, what's the tool that the Fed is using to control interest rates? What's keeping interest rates from going up? And my answer to that is, is two things. One, there's such a huge volume of reserves out there that that significantly reduces the scramble of, of, of uh, uh, banks to try to earn something higher, though when there's enough of a higher opportunity from things like GCF, they're going to go with that uh, instead of uh, wanting to park Fed funds. The other is that for a long time, nobody wanted to borrow. There was limited demand for borrowing funds of, of any sort. That was holding interest rates down. What's changed the last year? Well, for one thing, the Treasury is doing more borrowing than they were, putting upward uh, pressure on interest rates. That's maybe a factor bringing that GCF rate up. And that's a factor kind of shining a light on the current system that we really don't have a, a tool for controlling uh, I interest rates uh, directly. Instead, we're doing it sort of indirectly through, uh, I think, in part, the sheer volume of uh, excess reserves in the system. So now let me come back to the Fed's balance sheet. Uh, before I was talking about the asset side and, and what happened with the Fed's holdings of securities. Here's the summary of the balance sheet from the liabilities side, uh, total liabilities of the Federal Reserve uh, each week. Uh, light green here is currency held by the public, and that's grown steadily but <coughs> relatively slowly. The dark green is the excess reserves or, or reserves held by uh, depository institutions. That's what really funded this uh, large-scale asset purchases. That's, that's how the large-scale asset purchases were funded. Uh, the Fed bought all these treasury securities and mortgage-backed securities by essentially borrowing overnight from depository institutions by paying them interest on excess reserves. And now as we bring down the uh, the volume of excess reserves, uh, that's uh, eliminating some of this, this huge buffer. And that may be one factor that's causing us to see now uh, something very different going on in, in the Fed funds market. So what do I conclude from all that? Well, if it's the case that the reason we're not further reducing the Fed's balance sheet is because we're worried about whether we'd be able to control interest rates with a lower volume of reserves. Uh, 
that's a little bit worrisome because this is a pretty blunt instrument, the size of the Fed's balance sheet, the volume of excess reserves, whether it's two trillion or one trillion, is a very blunt, inaccurate instrument for targeting something like a short-term interest rates. Yeah, I think it has an influence, but uh, it, it's not the degree of influence you want for a, a true, uh, true target, a true policy instrument. And I think if the Fed continues to shrink its balance sheet, uh, this is gonna become more and more of an issue. Uh, exactly how does the Fed control uh, the interest rate? And in particular, I'm asking what controls it on the upside? What is the ceiling in, in uh, the current system? So in terms of uh, practical recommendations, uh, we might wanna be thinking about some other target interest rate other than the Fed funds rate. That's been sending a very strange signal for, for some time. Thinking of that as the goal, the main thing the Fed is deciding at each FOMC meeting on what's the Fed funds rate gonna be. In some ways, that's, that's, that's kind of a strange uh, thing to be focusing on in a, in a system like that. You might wanna think about GCF or, or some other uh, rate. And more fundamentally, perhaps for the first time in history, we should be thinking about the possibility of a corridor, true corridor type system where there's a real floor, there's a real ceiling, and, and we're clear about that. That's gonna require something like the discount window, but very different from the one we have historically. Obviously, there can't be a stigma associated with this, or it's, it's, it's not a, a ceiling at all. Uh, and, uh, but that's a possible direction that, uh, that I hope the Fed is, is thinking about as they go through this process of reevaluating uh, exactly how they're, uh, they're implementing monetary policy. Thanks, Jim, for uh, an extremely clear presentation. The discussant is Peter Aaron. Okay, um, in his presentation, Jim gave us all uh, a really great introduction to the key features of the Fed Reserve's new post-crisis operating procedures, and very usefully, I think, suggested some enhancements to the new program that the Fed might think about going forward. What I'd like to do here in my discussants comments is to take a step back and ask and then try and answer a series of interrelated questions raised by the details of his talk. I'm gonna start at the macro level by asking what, if anything, does all of this really have to do with monetary policy? And my answer to that question is, it actually seems to me not a lot. Now, just to be clear what I mean by that, it's not that anything about the new operating procedures is necessarily inconsistent with the Fed Reserve's more basic goals for monetary policy making. It's simply that in its details, which were the focus of Jim's presentation, it strikes me that this system is directed at something different and actually much more specific, namely clamping down on what would otherwise be high frequency day-to-day -day fluctuations in short-term nominal interest rates, that is, interest rate smoothing. So answering question number one will lead to question two, why would the Fed want to smooth interest rates in this particular way? I'm gonna suggest some macro reasons and microeconomic reasons for smoothing interest rates, but as I'll explain, I find the microeconomic justification more compelling. So answering that second question will lead me to a third. This will bring us back full circle to the microeconomic details that Jim just discussed, but I'll cast them or couch them in a more specific way by asking, if we take as given that the Fed wants to do this, smooth interest rates, what additional enhancements to the new system could be made to accomplish that goal more efficiently? So let's start at the top with the macro questions. As a macroeconomist, when I think about monetary policy, I like to do it with reference to two basic macroeconomic principles. The classical dichotomy, which draws a distinction between real and nominal variables, and the doctrine of long-run monetary neutrality, which tells us that in the long run, the Fed and the Fed alone is responsible for the behavior of nominal variables. Now to elaborate ever so slightly, in a capitalist economy, prices play a key role in allocating scarce resources. Prices have to adjust to maintain the balance between the supply of and demand for 
individual goods and services and to allow the equilibrium quantities of those individual goods and services, that is, real variables, respond efficiently to shocks that hit the economy. Economic theory, though, tells us that the prices that play that allocative role are relative prices, so that some additional institutional arrangement must be made to pin down the overall level of prices economy-wide. And in our economy, the Fed lies at the heart of that institutional arrangement. The Fed must conduct monetary policy in a way that pins down the behavior of the aggregate nominal price level and then by extension the behavior of all other nominal variables as well. And in theory, the central bank does this by exercising its monopoly control over the supply of base money, currency plus bank reserves. Now in practice, the workings of these basic macroeconomic mechanisms are obscured somewhat by the fact that the Fed rarely, if ever, describes its policy actions with reference to their implications for the monetary base. Instead, the Fed conducts monetary policy by targeting the federal funds rate. Now, before the financial crisis, though, you didn't have to dig very deeply beneath the surface to see the workings of the macro basics underlying federal funds rate targeting because under the pre-crisis operating procedures, whenever the Fed wanted to change its target for the funds rate, it would have to conduct open market operations, either adding reserves to or draining reserves from the banking system, depending on whether it wanted to lower the funds rate and ease policy or raise the funds rate and tighten policy. As Jim explained in his presentation, however, since December 2015, the Fed has been targeting the federal funds rate in a different way, in a way that's, I guess, most broadly described as uh, according to a floor system. Under a floor system, the Fed has manipulated the interest rate that it pays on its own short-term liabilities, like bank reserves, in order to bring about similar changes in the federal uh, funds rate without having to conduct open market operations right away. And this is a big advantage of the new system. It relieves the trading desk at the New York Fed from having to intervene in the funds market on a day-to-day -day basis just to defend the FOMC's federal funds rate target. But the point that I want to make here is that even under a floor system, any monetary policy action that is taken to influence the aggregate nominal price level must sooner or later be supported by open market operations that have implications for the Fed's supply of base money, hence for the size and composition of the Fed Reserve's balance sheet. So while it is true that the floor system allows the Fed to refrain from conducting open market operations immediately upon a change in the federal funds rate target, it's not completely true that the floor system totally divorces Fed Reserve monetary policy from the Fed Reserve's balance sheet. Now, the easiest way to see this is with an example, and here's the simplest example I can cook up to illustrate the basic point. To start, imagine that the market for reserves is in a long-run equilibrium, where the Fed is happy with the dollar volume of reserves it's supplying to the banking system, and banks in turn are happy to hold or demand the same dollar volume of reserves supplied. And now let's imagine that beginning from that initial equilibrium point, Nominal GDP continues to grow at a 5% annual rate. Now, looking out five years from the initial equilibrium point, 5% annual growth in nominal GDP is going to translate after compounding into an increase in the level of nominal GDP by more than 25%. So we can begin to see through this thought experiment how if over that five-year period, the Fed uses a floor system to target the federal funds rate but never conducts an open market operation ever again. The initial equilibrium is going to be severely disturbed because at the end of five years, banks are being asked to hold the same dollar volume of reserves as at the start, but the nominal size of the U.S. economy is 25% larger. So the thought experiment confirms that to the contrary, even under the floor system, the Fed will have to conduct along a steady state growth path 
periodic open market operations to expand the supply of base money at an annual rate approximating the average annual growth rate of nominal GDP. Now, many economists would probably prefer to describe the chain of events that unfolds in the story I just told in a different way. What most economists would say is, look, even in your story, the Fed is still using the floor system to target the federal funds rate. And as we know, the Federal Reserve targets the federal funds rate to achieve the dual mandate. That, in the popular view, is the monetary policy strategy. And the open market operations from my story, from that popular perspective, they occur, but they're really more like technical details. Of course, the Federal Reserve must gradually expand the supply of base money just to accommodate the increase in demand for reserves and currency that reflects the underlying growth of the U.S. economy. Now, I don't really object to the popular way of telling the story, but here's what nags me. There's an element of incompleteness about it, and that element of incompleteness risks confusing cause and effect. Because from a macroeconomic perspective, what you have to ask is, how come nominal GDP is growing at a 5% annual rate in the first place? The answer has to be that everybody understands that the Federal Reserve is conducting monetary policy in a way that will generate similar slow but steady growth in the supply of base money. So from that perspective, Macroeconomic fundamentals are still at work. We can still think of a monetary policy strategy as a strategy for controlling the supply of base money in order to pin down the long-run behavior of nominal variables. But the value added in this alternative perspective is that it shows us that the floor system, with all of its details, they're really directed at something else not so much monetary policy objectives, although they're, again, they're not inconsistent with those objectives, but they're directed towards something more specific. Again, smoothing out what would otherwise be high frequency fluctuations in short-term interest rates, that is, interest rate smoothing. So next question, why would the Fed want to smooth interest rates in this particular way? I can think of a macroeconomic reason. It's given by William Poole's cl classic or famous 1970 article, which uses a Keynesian model. So a Keynesian framework, which we now interpret to mean a macroeconomic framework that describes events over a time horizon short enough to allow us to credibly take the aggregate nominal price level as fixed. And in Poole's Keynesian model, he showed that over that interval where prices are fixed, Nominal interest rate instability can spill over and create real instability in output and employment as well. Now, there's an issue of interpretation with what constitutes the interest rate in Poole's model. I tend to argue that the interest rate in Poole's model is something like the average level of the federal funds rate over a period, let's say, of a month. But if we use a different interpretation and say the day-to-day -day fluctuations in the funds rate matter, I concede Poole's analysis gives us a rationale for interest rate smoothing. So if we say the Fed can smooth interest rates without sacrificing anything in terms of its monetary policy goals, why not? There is a reason. More compelling, though, it seems to me, is a microeconomic efficiency argument attributable to Milton Friedman in his essay from 1969 on the optimum quantity of money. The idea there is, under our fiat money system, the Fed creates liquidity at constant zero marginal cost. So those high frequency fluctuations in the user cost of liquidity that appeared in some of the graphs that uh, Jim showed us earlier, they are a sign of microeconomic inefficiency. Marginal cost of producing liquidity is different from marginal benefit enjoyed by private agents holding liquid assets. There's a more compelling argument, it seems to me, as to why the Fed should smooth out, again, even high-frequency movements in short-term interest rates. Now, that brings me back to the issues that Jim discussed in, uh, in his uh, presentation. 
if we take as given the idea that the Fed wants to smooth interest rates in this way on a day-to-day -day basis, then we really have to admire the design of floor or corridor systems because they harness the power of the free market to do all the work on the Fed's behalf. The idea in theory is you set the discount rate, use that as your ceiling, set the interest rate on reserves, use that as your floor. And if the federal funds rate itself ever departs from the corridor, an arbitrage opportunity opens up. Traders come in to exploit the arbitrage opportunity and their trading strategies snap the equilibrium funds rate back inside the band. The problem that Jim highlighted with his talk is that historically and even today, layered on top of what we see as the beginnings of a very efficient system to do what the Fed wants are all of these institutional, regulatory, and legal constraints that inhibit the market mechanism from working as it should. So like Jim explained, historically, the discount rate has not set a ceiling for the federal funds rate. And more recently, the interest rate on reserves has not set a floor. And again, from a microeconomic efficiency argument, I take unexploited arbitrage opportunities seriously. Because unexploited arbitrage opportunity is just a fancy word or set of words for deviations from the law of one price. And deviations from the law of one price are almost always a sign of microeconomic efficiency. So just to conclude, if I had to use Jim's paper to deliver a message to the Fed, here is what I would say. You want to smooth interest rates, and we can think of good reasons for doing so. We also greatly admire the workings of a floor or corridor system, precisely because, again, they use market mechanisms to do all of the work for the Fed. They don't require daily interventions in the funds market just to defend a constant target. On the other hand, we see overlaid on top of what should be a very efficient system, all of these institutional complications or regulatory constraints. Why not clean that up and let the market do the work for you? Then you can focus on your more basic macroeconomic objective, creating and maintaining a backdrop of nominal stability that can in turn let the capitalist system do what it does best. What is that? to create robust long-run growth and income and jobs. Okay. Thanks, Peter, for a great discussion. Uh, Jim, would you like to um, yeah, respond to his comments? Uh, just briefly, th thanks a lot, Peter. Uh, of course, you're right, at a as a deeper philosophical level, the ultimate power of the central bank comes from it being the monopoly supplier of base money. But the, the reason you can run a corridor system, a traditional corridor system, the only way you can offer to lend as much as anybody wants at a fixed rate is if you have the power to create those, those funds. Without that power, you, you, you can't do it. So yeah, that, that's, that's b behind uh, the traditional system, absolutely. Now, as far as the demand for base money, the game we've been playing is that if we pay interest on reserves, Maybe there's an uh, essentially infinite demand. I mean, we go from one trillion to two trillion to, to whatever. And, and my point is, well, that worked for a while. That worked in a certain environment when there really isn't other opportunities. But uh, it's, it, it's not fundamentally a, a system for controlling uh, uh, the interest rate. But, uh, and, and so that's why my conclusion is we do need the discount window, something as a real uh, corridor system and, and, and might be thinking about it that way. But uh, absolutely, thank you for pointing out about the, the, the value of the market allocation. The, the point is when your Fed funds rate is the set interest rate minus nine basis points every day, this is not a, a market allocation of anything. It's, it, it's sort of a crazy system to, to have been thinking that was our, our, our target for uh, uh, influencing the price level and economic activity. Okay, so we'll open up the floor for questions. There's a, uh, so John Taylor will ask you for a question. So, uh, neither of you referred too much to how it worked before 2008. The Fed set a federal funds rate, they voted on it, 
They adjusted the supply of reserves, so it would come in to meet pretty close to a target. Uh, Peter Fisher ran the desk pretty well at that time. It seemed to work. So uh, why not just go back to that? You had It worked. It, policy was good. We had good economic performance. I think in a way it was it was more market determined. You, you didn't have an administered rate, right? It just, uh, you had the market, and the market allocated capital to different banks. It, uh, and then you also had a connection between um, the monetary aggregates and the base, which has really disappeared at this point. So it seems to me that's, the, that's a possible way to go. I don't know where it's, if we're going to get back to that, but why not consider that? Yeah, so that system, we were talking about $5 billion. Was, was sort of the level of reserves. So now we're talking about $2 trillion. So there's a, there's a big gap but between those, a big gap to where you get to the point where reserves are kind of so precious that, that you get the, uh, the balance off of supply and, and demand like that. Uh, one technical issue is how do you deal with the other sources of volatility, the treasury balance. Uh, for example, it used to just vary by a billion from one day to the next, and, and now we're talking about hundreds of billions of dollars uh, over the course of a, uh, of a few months there. So uh, there, there, might, there would be technical issues with that. Uh, we definitely have to get away from the reverse repo on demand because that puts huge volatility into the uh, uh, level of research. So uh, I think that's a harder place to get to from where we are now relative to just saying, okay, a corridor system. Right. My answer to your question, John, would say that simply rephrases my first point, which I think a lot of this doesn't have to do with monetary policy at all. If you want to join me in thinking about policy as controlling the base to stabilize the price level, that's fine. If you want to think about it as following a Taylor rule in order to stabilize nominal spending or a linear comedy to achieve the dual mandate, basically. There's nothing about the new system that says we have to have that and can't go back to the old way. Conditional on having a giant balance sheet, conditional on the New York Fed saying we don't want to have to play the game of estimating the demand for reserves on a day-to-day -day basis, and conditional on saying that you're going to continue targeting the federal funds rate with a floor system. My response would be, okay, if that's where you're at, then why not just run, a four, I mean, a four or a corridor system theoretically holds together based on arbitrage opportunities. So w why, after conceding all of that, you set, try and set up a, a floor system where the floor isn't the floor and, the ce and there is no ceiling? Kristen, Richard? Jeff Lacker. It seems simpler than you make it sound, Jim. Um, in the period before uh, the crisis that you explained with such clarity, um, the RP rate varied significantly from the funds rate target, at times 10, 20 basis points below, at times 10, 20 basis points above, and in fact was pretty volatile day to day, week to week, month to month. Um, now we seem to care about the gap between the RP rate and the, the funds rate or whatever, or the interest rate on excess reserve. And I've never heard, and I never heard at the FOMC, a coherent reason why. Now, the federal funds rate used to be our target. Now we set an interest rate on excess reserves. And as you rightly point out, the federal funds rate is somewhat of a sort of a niche market, uh, anachronistic appendage in some sense. So. From my point of view, interest rate control seems simple. We control the interest rate, the Fed controls the interest rate on excess reserves, period. And the spreads between the interest rate on excess reserves and other rates are determined by the vagaries of the various regulatory constraints on various classes of participants in financial markets. And we let that do what it does for various reasons, <laughs> as you illustrated with the federal funds rate, but you know, equally, uh, cogent regulatory constraints, as you pointed out, affect the RP rate on a day-to-day, week-to-week, and month-to-month -month basis. So why don't we just set the interest rate on excess reserves and go home? Now, there is a coherent reason, and it has to do with Fed governance. The law that gave the Federal Reserve the authority to set interest on reserves gave that authority to a subset of the Federal Open Market Committee, 
the Board of Governors. And setting the federal funds rate target has always been the purview of the Federal Open Market Committee. So in some sense, targeting the federal funds rate is um, merely window dressing around this inconvenient governance arrangement around the interest rate on excess reserves. The obvious solution would be to the a very simple uh, one-line uh, bill um, reattribute that authority to the Federal Open Market Committee rather than the board. Uh, so, I was I was using an RP rate not so much because I said I was wanting to say that's what the target should be, but because that's a true market rate. Uh, unlike the Fed funds rate, which which is kind of a meaningless uh, signal here. But I think ultimately the the issue is what we care about are things like the three-month commercial paper rate. That's what ultimately is going to influence uh, economic activity. If you have a tight link between your policy tool and that, then you have an ability to get the price level and economic activity where you want. Uh, but if there's uh, I, I, I'm not sure I see how just a pure interest on reserves with no, no upper bound would really give, a, give the Fed the ability to hit its target. So, so your answer is, if if they've set the interest on reserves and we're seeing commercial paper too much above that, we just flood more and more reserves out there until it comes down? Is that? Well, I, I, we never in the past, I think, uh, at, the, at the Fed, never sort of engaged in some feedback from the CP rate. I mean, it was looking at the entire macro economy. Commercial paper rate would vary, but setting the funds rate is equivalent to you know now setting the interest rate on reserves why don't we just say we've set the interest rate on reserves we don't need the rrp facility and uh you know we could back away from the funds market as a target and in the end it's a it's about the bank's indif indifference between keeping money as reserves or other investments rather than indifference between lending in the funds market and other interest rates as it was under the other system We have a question from John Cochran, and then here and here. I'd like to ask the opposite of John Taylor's question, in part because this is one, one, one issue on which we disagree, and in part because it's the big elephant in the room. It's the issue for the Fed's strategy question which I'll put this way, what we've learned in the last 10 years is you can pay interest on reserves and you can be satiated in reserves, and guess what? That doesn't cause inflation. Second, we've gone to this view that the Fed, what the Fed does is target an interest rate. So if you want to target interest rates, and anything else, if you want to target the price of tomatoes, you've got to say, well, tomatoes are three bucks a pound, come and get them. Buy and sell infinite amounts. Somehow the Fed wants to target an interest rate and also target the quantity. Uh, I hear Jim starting with, well, let's just have a narrow carter, which means bring us your treasuries, we'll give you as many reserves as you want. Conversely, you know, we'll lend you as many reserves as you want. If you want to target an interest rate, that's what you got to do. It seems to me the logical conclusion of both of those things is just target those things. Don't, as Jim said later, limit the, uh, the RP uh, project. Let anyone who wants have them at the same rate as anyone else. Given that view, given that we're trying to target interest rates, why bother controlling the level of reserves at all? Let's leave aside the political considerations on the balance sheet, which are there. I heard a hint from Peter. Some, there's some sort of vague memory of MV equals PY and so forth. But I don't know of any well-worked-out theory since about 1975, that you, or even before then, that you can simultaneously target an interest rate and the quantity of money and that this is necessary or appropriate or, or anything of the sort. I mean, we've just been targeting interest rates. So why limit the size of the balance sheet at all for economic reasons? Let's leave aside political, institutional, and so forth. That seems to me the, the elephant question in the room. You know, I, I think that was the point I was trying to make in response to Peter, that, that you are committed 
if you have the, the upper and lower bound lend all people want, you are committing to a, a quantity from that. You can't choose the two things separately. And yeah, uh, exactly. And, and but then the question is, okay, what's, what's the interest rate and implicit quantity that's consistent with price stability? So that's where it all comes down. But just in terms of the mechanical question of how do you do it, I think what you do is announce, come and get it, and make sure you, the price you've announced is one that's consistent with everything else you want to see happen. Right. Remember, the one added degree of freedom that the Fed has received since 2008 is the ability to pay interest on reserves. So actually, now you've got the overall level of nominal interest rates economy-wide, which we think through some Keynesian interest rate channel on aggregate demand, is what really matters for monetary policy. And then, as you say, you can either decide how much reserves you want in the banking system and peg the spread, the opportunity cost to banks of holding reserves, or you peg the spread and you accept the dollar volume of reserves. But let me say that even under that system, here's what I was trying to get at. is a logical matter. No one should care whether we're talking, whether we're measuring reserves in, in dollars or cents, okay? The, what we're talking about with reserves demand is a, a real demand for reserves, okay? So if, from in, a, in a macroeconomic model, if you have a dynamic stochastic general equilibrium with a steady state growth path for nominal variables where they grow at 2% per year, my point is that uh, you know, after the transition is done, you, you know, either you've set the spread and accepted the real quantity or set the real quantity and accepted what the spread has to be. From that moment forward, it is still true that the monetary base is going to grow, is going to have to grow at a rate proportional to the price level. The only reason why I bring this up again is that, again, it's an element of incompleteness that runs the risk of letting the system that you say works well unravel completely. This is what you hear from central bankers that work through a hyperinflation. They'll say, but we have to keep printing money to keep up with the demand because the price level is rising so fast. I, I'm uneasy about an intellectual framework that appears to suggest that um, an, an expansion in a nominal magnitude is, is just done exclusively to accommodate demand. A question in the second row and then third row. Yeah, uh, uh, very simple, uh, Sebastian. In other words, should we be worried about the cost of paying the very large excess? I, I, I think it's about two trillion now. I mean, th this is non uh, at two and a half percent is non-trivial, and uh, my area of uh, of, of the, the, my region of uh, interest has been Latin America, where central banks basically have to be bailed out. I think that uh, Ken or someone mentioned in the morning, every four years. Is this something we should worry about? I, I think we should, and for that, I would just refer you to Charlie Plosser's article from this conference. I guess it was two years ago. Uh, again, if, if, if it were me deciding, I would say, as Charlie did, there are just so many economic and political costs and complications of working with a, balance, a big balance sheet. There's the direct cost, and there's also the political cost, because the Fed is seen as an institution that can issue interest uh, earning liabilities and use the proceeds to purchase interest earning assets, that starts to make the Fed look less and less like a central bank and more and more like a commercial bank. And you mentioned MMT. Th that feeds into that entire mentality. So it, from a long run perspective, I'd rather just work things back down and, and do it as John said, in the old way. But I think, you know, but just to go back to what, what Jim said, earlier, I mean, given that the balance sheet is so big at this very moment, and given that the consensus seems to be the adjustment has to take place over time, okay, we sort of, you have to pay interest on reserves, otherwise you'll get inflation right away. Yeah, let me just add, if you're asking 
should we be worried that the Fed's going to make a loss? The answer to that on average is clearly no. The Fed is borrowing short and lending long at a higher rate. They're, they're raking in money with this carry trade on average. Uh, now, it's not always that way, and you could imagine a situation where they have a pretty big loss, and there's a political economy question of does the Treasury actually bail them out? How mechanically do you run the loss? And there are the various issues that, that Peter raises, but, but there's no doubt currently it's very profitable for the Fed to have this huge volume of short-term borrowing it essentially does with interest and reserves and then earning a higher rate on their portfolio. Unless it gets inverted, yeah. So on average, it isn't. A question in the second row here and then here. Yeah. No, it's a really great uh, panel. Um, I wanted to follow up on Jeff Lacker's question. And th so you want to have a simple corridor system. You need to use a large liquid market, which the Fed funds market is not anymore. Wh what about... Um, using the repo market. So the floor would be the reverse repo offer rate, which they already have, and you'd have a ceiling of a repo offer rate, which I think they're co contemplating. Um, and then um, you'd shoot for a midpoint, uh, but the ECB and other central banks do this, they call it fine tuning operations. So sometimes you hit the floor, sometimes you hit the ceiling, you adjust the reserves, you can do it once a week or once a month, it's not a big deal, even if you're running at the ceiling or the floor, if the floor and the ceiling are too far apart. And this would become an FOMC decision because historically um, open market operations you know, um, you know, are, are, are managed by FOMC and so the FOMC could set the, the repo offer rate and the, and, the, and, the, and the reverse repo offer rate and, to, and totally skirt. IOER would just go much further into the background and a lot of the Fed's liabilities and assets would become repos and reverse repos. Maybe the bank reserves would also shrink a lot. Um, I'm just wondering, is this a, would that be a direction that's worth considering? Yeah, uh, very much. Questions on this side? Yep. Yeah, uh, uh, Jim, I had a, a quick comment on something you said because I think it's a bit of an urban myth. It's actually a New York myth. <laughs> You said, you said that the volatility of the TGA is make, makes it hard to go back to a corridor, but that's not the right story. When they went to a floor system, the TGA, the Treasury re understood that it didn't have to worry about smoothing the, the TGA account. It stopped using the TTNL accounts. So this is a perfect example of where uh, Lucas' critique applies. The, the, the Treasury balance is volatile because they've gone to a floor system. It would be less so if the Treasury had an incentive to manage the TGA as it used to when uh, it was necessary to help a corridor system or corridor type system work. So I don't think that that should be treated as a, a deep parameter. I think as we were discussing last night, I think there's definitely something to that. But I think there's also the political factors with the debt ceiling and so on that, that are also playing a role in those very huge buildups of the Treasury account that we see. <clears throat> Let's say for the sake of argument that despite the Fed's best efforts, nothing comes out of this year review. So they're the same tools, the same framework, and we go into recession. It seems likely QE is gonna be an important tool we're going to see the balance sheet expand even more because we have low interest rates. So this is going to be a, an increasingly important issue. The size of the balance sheet is going to get larger and larger. And to me, this is, this is consequential because it, it, it gets into the question, well, how big of a footprint do you want the Fed to have? Do you want to crowd out the money markets? I think that's the first question. The second one would be, um, do you want the Fed to get into the role of public debt management? I mean, by taking Treasury securities out and putting reserves onto the market, you're substituting one form of government liability for the other, and reserves aren't as fungible as treasuries. And I think that's a question that needs to be wrestled with as an implication of sticking with a large balance sheet. That was a statement, not a question, but I agree <laughs> with it. Uh, yeah. So we have a question in the back here and then here. Uh, Jim, you talked a lot about the corridor. Uh, but how would you feel about shrinking the size of the corridor until it becomes a line? And 
you, net, at that point, the Fed just borrows and lends at one rate. Uh, well, as Peter was saying, I think it's very helpful to the Fed to have a real market signal of something. And so uh, we've got a range, and we see it's bumping against the top of that range. That, that, that tells us something. And uh, uh, also, I want to underscore what Peter was saying. That, uh, you know, there is a long-run equilibrium, what this volume of reserves ought to be and how it ought to grow over time. And uh, watching that feedback is the essence of what monetary policy has, has to be. So I'm in favor of a range. I'm in favor of a real market signal within that range, giving the Fed guidance as to whether their plans are consistent with where they want to take the economy. I think you'd have more of a signal and less noise with the line because well, then- you get your line back when you get a line. Because, right? well, because then you would observe the quantity and that would tell you just how much the reserves demand curve had moved horizontally. So instead of getting a, a mixed signal, that would be a clean one. Well, that gets respect to the whole Friedman debate. Are the quantities the more useful signal or the, or the interest rates? I, I think interest rates are pretty useful signals. A question here? I just want to follow up on John Taylor's uh, comment earlier. Uh, it may seem because of the current size of the Fed funds market that it's irrelevant and that it, it, it can't be used as a tool, but that's very much a consequence of policy decisions. So uh, let me remind you how you could bring back the Fed funds market. Um, so first of all, it wouldn't be too hard to raise required reserves on large banks with little consequence because currently they face under the Basel requirements very high liquid assets requirements. So you could soak up a lot of the excess reserves by just making required reserves for banks bigger. You could avoid your micro problem, uh, Peter, by paying interest on required reserves only, like Fed funds less 10 basis points, and then you could pay zero interest on excess reserves, um, and, and then um, it would also be helpful to shut the GSEs out of the Fed funds market. Uh, so if you did that, if you did those things, wouldn't be too hard to go back to the world of pre-2008. Um, now I understand that some people have other worlds in mind, but uh, I think that's a, an attractive world in a lot of ways, and I think we got away from that world because of, in my view, political reasons that the Fed wanted to use adjustments to monetary policy that didn't cause their balance sheet sh to change size. Um, so reverse repos are an obvious example of a way that you can shrink uh, contractionary monetary policy without actually reducing your reported size and having the accounting consequences of capital losses that go along with that. So I think the political consequences are more of a driver than maybe where our discussion is indicating. And I think returning to the pre-2008 environment is not so inconceivable if we had a, a, the will to do that. Okay, we have time for one or two more questions. There's a question here. Andy Fillard, OBIS. Um, just to um, ask this one question um, is the following. Uh, so we haven't talked about the LCR requirement, and the LCR requirement can be you, you can use treasuries or you can use uh, reserves. Is one of the reasons why we have to move to a floor or to a floor or a uh, corridor system a function of the fact that uh, we don't know what the demand for LCR is in terms of reserves, which means that we don't know what the demand for reserves is by the banks, we'll never be able to elicit that because if you ask the banks how much they need, they'll always multiply their real need because it's free uh, insured money for them. And is this one of the complications that the Fed might need to take a stand on, which is they need to announce how much of the LCR they're going to allow reserves to fulfill in order to get back to something that's closer to the pre-2008 uh, regime? My point was not so much the uncertainty about it, but the, the deterministic nature of it, at least at these volumes, that it was, it, you know, it, rather than an equilibrium uh, marginal uh, regulatory cost, it was just essentially some fixed number for, for quite a while. Uh, and, and the key aspect of that was that Fed funds signal is nothing other than the input you put in through the 
uh, interest on excess reserves. So I, I was talking about it from a more mechanical point of view. Now, there are other questions. I mean, this whole idea of you're only going to worry about your capital requirements the last day of the month is very strange to me, and, and that's introducing all kinds of volatility daily in these interest rates. A final question by Jim Bullard in the second row. Thanks, Jim Bullard, St. Louis Fed. I just want to push back a little bit on the, the idea of going back to the 2008 uh, or earlier operating procedure. First of all, it's not all clear to me that that's like the optimal way to do things, so that's one thing. Um, you know, it's not like it's a holy grail or something like that. Uh, the size of the balance sheet uh, is going to be much bigger. Currency is much bigger today. It's 1.7 trillion. You got the Treasury general account used to be five billion, now 250 billion. That's the decision of the U.S. Treasury, not of the Fed. So uh, we could talk to them, I guess, but uh, that's not really that's that's something we just have to take on board. And then you've got uh, the regulatory environment changing with Dodd Frank, and the the emphasis on high quality liquid assets has driven the demand for reserves from 30 or 40 billion up to trillion or more. I guess you could push back against that, but I mean, the, the Milton Friedman side of me says, well, if the world needs liquidity, supply the liquidity. So that's gonna put you up at three trillion or more uh, right off the bat. So it's not, you're not gonna go back to that earlier size of balance sheet. When I look around at central banks around the world, they've got quarter systems. You know, They've got, uh, just like Jim was talking about, uh, so put in a repo program to complement the reverse repo program. You meet an international standard, it seems to work well for other central banks. We get rid of our kind of jerry-rig system that we had before the, before the crisis. So all of this seems okay to me, even if you're a Chicago monetarist. So I just want to... Right. <laughs> I don't that think was evil things are happening, except for I, I, I do buy the political critique that there, there's room for more mischief. I kind of agree with that. But that was my message to the Fed which you seem to have fully absorbed. I mean, if if that's what you want to do, run with the, the big balance sheet and smooth out interest rates, then the corridor system makes a lot of sense because it lets the market do it for you. Uh, you know, so yes, why not work towards a system that is unencumbered by all of these institutional and regulatory constraints, workarounds like RP instead of um, federal funds, like what David Andelfado and Jane Eerig have proposed, which is like a replacement for the discount window without stigma that would harness market forces to do exactly what you want to do. Okay, so thanks a lot, Jim and Peter, for a great session, and we have a 15-minute break.